for me to take, Cassie. All right, that feels that feels much better. Okay, <laughs> so thank you everyone uh, for jumping on to the webinar. Uh, the presenters today, I'm excited. This is the first time I think, Sarah, that we've had you on. Is that right? It is. Yeah. Huge, huge mistake on our part for not making this happen sooner. <laughs> uh, so I'm founder and CEO uh, of Pringer Solutions Group and Ask Genius. Uh, Andrew Mankey on your screen. Many of you met before. He runs our, our Ask Genius software. Sarah Ligo is our senior development consultant. She knows everything there is to know uh, about direct mail and working with print shops and lock boxes and gift processing and postage rates and everything that you need to know to run a really good direct mail appeal. So we're excited to have Sarah here today. And Sarah, where are you uh, located at again for the folks that joined late? Yeah, I'm actually right outside of Kansas City in Lawrence, Kansas, home of home of the Jayhawks is where we are. Ugh, I roll. <laughs> um, all right, not everybody can be a great Blue Jays fan. That's okay. All right, as background, so I'm going to do the, the usual background on who we are, and then we'll dive into the topic of the day. We'll share some links as we go. Um, a lot of times we'll be referencing previous webinars we did. People always say, hey, where can we get a hold of that information? We'll make sure to drop those links in the uh, chat for you. Uh, as a housekeeping item, before I, I go any further, if you have questions, so I know we just finally got the chat working, which is good. We unplugged the, the jam there. Um, if you have questions as we go, use that Q&A button on your screen. Uh, if you write a question in the chat, we'll lose it because other people will chat and it'll kind of float off our screen. If you put your question in the Q&A button, then it will show up on our screen and it won't go away until we actually answer your question. So that's the spot to go with any questions that you have. And yes, this is being recorded. Yes, we will send you the recording and slides and everything else uh, right after the webinar. Okay, so as background on who we are, and I know many of you, I see so many familiar names um, here on the list. We got a couple hundred people here today. Um, many of you know us, for those of you that don't, uh, we run a company called Pringer Solutions Group. Um, where we do fundraising consulting, we run annual appeals, we do some outsourced razor's edge database administration, uh, and we even do some fundraising automation. Uh, we're a team of about 15 people who have worked for amazing organizations all over the country. Uh, we're based here in Omaha, but people like Sarah is in Kansas, Andrew Mankey is up in Minnesota, we have folks all over the country. Uh, so that's what we are, that is our day job. We run a fundraising consulting firm. Uh, you probably have heard of one of our products that we released. Uh, we didn't intend to be a software company, uh, but we ended up coming up with this really cool tool called Ask Genius, uh, which helps people set ask amounts. We can speak a little bit to that later, but not very much. Uh, today, we're going to focus on direct mail. Uh, where we're at, we've been doing a series of webinars uh, over about the past year, and we're just going to keep doing it. Uh, we have committed to uh, what we call building in public. Uh, so as we run, uh, our multi-million dollar annual appeals for clients every year. We are responsible for millions of donor records uh, and raising tens of millions of dollars a year. As we do that, we're always looking to improve uh, what we do. So if we can find a way to design a better brochure, if we can find a way to design a better donation page, we will do that. And then we will host a webinar and let the whole world know for free what we've done and what we learned. And we've been doing that, frankly, because it's a lot of fun. Uh, we, we enjoy getting to meet people uh, on webinars like this. Of course, we also want people to take a look at the Ask Genius product that we have, which is pretty crazy uh, useful. Um, but we also just like to share what we've learned uh, and pay it forward. So some of the areas we've already done webinars from, uh, if any of these uh, pique your interest, uh, let us know. We can drop a link in the chat. Uh, so we started with all of our research on donor personas and how to write to different donor personas. Uh, we did a really popular uh, webinar on pledge card design, uh, and you can actually even download a template uh, from that webinar. We talked about how to set the perfect ask amounts. We talked about fundraising letters, online donation pages, social media, on and on. This is where we're at today. So we're talking about direct mail fundraising strategies and a lot of tips and tricks and things like that. The next one we have on tap uh, is coming up. Uh, it's about how to use email in your fundraising appeals. We get that question quite a bit. Uh, so we'll drop that in uh, the chat. Uh, so make sure to sign up for the next one we're doing. It's This is about direct mail. That one is about how to supplement your direct mail with some really good email. Oof, Sarah, that was a lot of throat clearing just to get to the actual meat of the presentation today. Are you still with go. me? <laughs> still with you. All right. So let's let's start. Let's set the table this way. What do you need to know about direct mail? We will start with uh, something that everybody needs to know. We'll start with a little truth bomb. Uh, we talked about this on our social media webinar last week. People don't click on social media posts to make a donation. They also don't just randomly show up on your website to make a donation. Those things don't happen. And as much as we, PSG, are a digital firm, we do all sorts of crazy technical fun things to help people raise money. The truth of the matter is all of that is secondary to direct mail. 
Okay. So pause, gather yourself. I know that was, was a controversial thing to say, but direct mail is still the king of fundraising. Uh, if you are running a high school, if you're running a hospital foundation, uh, a university, uh, a Catholic diocese, uh, any organization that's running an annual appeal that's doing fundraising, the backbone of what you're doing is direct mail. So it's really important that we get it right and why we have experts like Sarah to share some tips and tricks with us. Um, the way that we look at it internally uh, is with a delicious analogy uh, of a great looking chili dog right there. Uh, direct mail, if you're if you're making chili dogs for some folks, uh, direct mail is both the hot dog and the bun. It is the essence. It is almost the entire meal in and of itself. Online donation page is the mustard. Email campaign is the relish. What the onions can be social media. I'm sure there's other things we can do with this. The point of it is uh, direct mail is the core of what you're doing as a fundraiser. Everything else is supplemental. Everything else is just a condiment on the delicious direct mail hot dog that you're working on. So with that, let's talk about what goes into your direct mail. And there's two things we're gonna talk about first, um, and then we're gonna get into some tips and tricks. First, let's talk about the fundraising letter itself. Um, we did an entire presentation on this, it's an hour long. I'm gonna give you the two minute version and then we'll drop the link in the chat so you can go uh, learn a little bit more if you're curious. So when you're going about writing the world's greatest fundraising letter, which is something we have talked about daily for about four years, because again, Clients pay us a lot of money in order to raise more money through their appeal. Anything we can learn on how to write a better letter, we're gonna implement that. Here's the, the cliff note version uh, of the hour long webinar, which you can of course go check out. Uh, the first thing we're gonna recommend, you have to start with the why. Why do you do what you do? Okay. Why does your organization exist? It exists for a reason, not just to fundraise. So it might be your nonprofit that believes everybody you know, deserves an equal opportunity. Uh, your mission might be you're worried. You're worried about the future we're leaving our kids and we have to do something. That's why our nonprofit exists. You might exist because we have a duty. We need to help the less fortunate or we want this you know, to be a great place to live. The zoo in Omaha has a mission of they want Omaha to be incredible, right? And have a place where families can go and where we can bring in other folks to, to experience our, our great community. Uh, maybe you believe that kids should be safe and happy. The point is you have a why and this sounds so simple and easy, but I will tell you from every client that, that brings us on board, it's really hard to do because you get stuck in a rut. Um, so you need to focus not on uh, sending out a letter that's that's a brochure and has a bunch of stats and things. You have to write a letter uh, that speaks to your donor and all that your donor cares about. They don't care about metrics. They don't care about stats. They don't care about any of that of year over year performance. They care about why you do what you do. There's a reason they support your organization. And in order to do that, the best tip I have, you gotta shift your focus, right? So when you're writing your fundraising letter, you remember this, your appeal is not about how wonderful your organization is, okay? Your appeal is about how wonderful your donor is. The letter you write should not be about how great your organization is. I don't care if you have the best habitat for humanity in the country. I don't care if you have you know, stats that will blow people away. Write it about the donor. Your donor is the point of the letter. It's not about your organization, it's about the donor and why they are incredible, why they support Habitat for Humanity, um, why they are special for all of those same reasons and why you exist. Sarah, is this hard? I know you're always at the front lines when a client brings us on. Um, do we see this, this happen a lot, like when we're looking at past letters and things? Yeah, uh, 100%. Usually it's the idea of having to change. Um, if you've been in direct mail fundraising long enough, you've been told it needs to be short, concise, three paragraphs, one of them's an ask, get in and get out, right? Terrible, terrible advice, by the way. It is. Um, and that's not the case. You're going to lose your donors immediately. So. Yep. So um, how do we do that? So you want to focus on the why. You want to, we, we use the word heartfelt all the time, um, right? With your donor in mind. I mean, keep in mind, and, and we'll send these slides because people, I, I'm getting a couple messages of people and make sure that they're, <laughs> you can tell we struck a note. People are asking for the slides already. What do your donors want? They, they, they want to belong, right? They want to see their values and actions. They want to win. You know, they want to feel good. They want to feel loved. They want to feel smart and needed and appreciated. All of the things, those are what your donors want. Keep those in mind. Again, I, I'm not looking to reinvent the webinar we did on, on uh, how to write the letter. Go check that out if you want to. <clears throat> Another quick tip, write a letter that makes your reader nod his or her head. That's how you know you're writing a great fundraising letter. If you can hand it to someone um, and you're hitting your core audience and they're nodding their head as they read it, that means you've struck gold. That is, a, that, that is the, the feeling that you want with every letter that you send out. Um, 
Sarah, what's the big secret uh, about donors that we know here at PSG that we're now going to release to the world here? What's the secret about donors? Your donors are old. They're old. <laughs> The average age is 68. It's always been 68 and it will forever be 68. <laughs> yes, thank you. So that is shocking. Gather yourselves. People just spilled coffee all over their desks. Um, the myth of the young donor, right? Of course, there are some young donors out there. And of course, it's important that you appeal to young donors. But the fact of the matter is people enter their prime giving years when they're old, right? Whether they were born in 1900 or 1950 or 1980, best year to be born, uh, the time that they're doing their donations is when they're old. That's just how it is, right? So look at your list. I'm sure you can do an age screen and find out the exact truth, which is that your average donor age is 68 years old. So right for that audience, right? Um, this is how your donors should feel after reading your fundraising letter. Okay? They should feel like superheroes. That is how you know you've written a good letter. That's not just about your organization and full of stats and we serve this many meals, you know, and we reduced our overhead by X, Y, Z. Nobody cares, right? The couple on the screen who are your prime donors, they want to feel like a hero, right? You supported us because you care about these same things we do. You know, there are people like you and you're making a difference. That's how you write your letter. Okay. <clears throat> We've talked a lot about substance. Let's talk about formatting. Uh, so more of the, the, the qualitative, excuse me, the quantitative stuff here. Uh, we have done so much research into what makes for the best letter. Uh, we get emails and questions about this sort of thing all the time. Here's the Cliff Notes version. Yeah. Your letter should be from a from a um, process standpoint, from a printing standpoint, from a technical standpoint. Here's what you should do for your letter, right? Of course, make it heartfelt, right? For your 68 year old donors and all the things we talked about, heartfelt and informal. You should have indented paragraphs. I know that will drive you nuts. It drives me nuts to do it every time, but it works. If it didn't work, we wouldn't do it. Font size 13 or 14. Uh, Sarah, why does the font need to be so big? Because your donors are older. They are. <laughs> they can't yeah. read an 11 or a 12 even. They can't. And they also have a hard time reading uh, sans serif fonts. Right. Uh, serif is a little thing like uh, if you have a capital T, little wing lids. Curly, yeah. The little curly guys, those are serifs. Times New Roman uh, is a serif font. It's easier to read. That's why when you pick up a paperback at the bookstore, it's written in a serif font because they're easier to read. Uh, underlined words and bold words. It should be two to four pages long. That goes against all the terrible advice that your board members have been giving you and everybody that says, nobody has time. We need to shorten this, make it punchy with bullet points. Dead wrong. Um, you should have longer page, longer uh, letters uh, because the people that are gonna donate to you are the people who want to read every word you have to say, right? They care about your organization. They want a heartfelt letter. The longer your letter, the more money you're gonna raise typically. Um, what is a Johnson box, Sarah, really go? Yeah, so there's actually an official term for the, the copy you see right there on the right. So the Johnson box is really used to call out a, your attention to something important, whether that's a thank you or a special verse or whatever it may be, um, or a quote. It's just something to stand out from the letter. Yep, nailed it. Uh, I'm going to pause for a second because there's a great question here. It says, our executive director wants us to write the letter on an eighth grade level. I disagree. You should be writing on about a sixth grade level. That is where your sweet spot is. Andrew Manke, is it the Hemingway app? Is that what we, we shared last time? Yes. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So yeah, you can, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, well, you can you can uh, upload your letter and see what, what grade level it's at. Um, so that's that's a good app to use. Um, and then also just keep in mind that some of the some of the greatest novels ever written were at a sixth grade, seventh grade level. Um, you think of like Lord of the Rings. That's a seventh grade level. As long as it is and as long as it takes to get through it, it it's it's a seventh grade level. So yeah. keep that in mind as well. Short sentences, clear words, don't over fluff it. Um, Hemingway app, I believe someone can check me and drop that into the chat. Um, we use it all the time. Write your letter in Word, copy it, paste it into this free website, and it will do all sorts of great things like tell you if you're using too much passive voice, it'll tell you what reading uh, level you're at. Uh, it's incredible. So great question from there. Uh, the font we recommend is on the screen there, Times New Roman. Okay, I promise not to keep stopping us to answer questions, but I wanted to make sure I, I tackle that Hemingway one over there. Okay, so Johnson Box. Uh, Sarah, did you know that people don't actually read letters? I 100% knew. Actually, <laughs> um, the reality is, is when somebody opens up your letter, they're going three places first, right? They're looking to make sure that you spelled their name correctly and that their name is in there. Um, then their eyes are going to that Johnson box, right? They're looking at any open space and something that's standing out. And then they're flipping to the back or the end and looking at that PS. So yep. if those three things are intact, they're going to say, huh, okay. 
and they'll continue reading. Um, so those, if, you, if nothing else, make sure those three things are solid with all of your direct mail letters. That is the entry into your letter. So if you're, <clears throat> and we have clients all the time who are saying, Nick, I don't want to write a PS. That's not my style. That's great, right? And it's always a client's decision, but you should know if you don't have a PS, you're getting rid of the entry point into the letter for many folks. They look at their name, they look at the Johnson box, the PS. So again, everybody is, is free to choose their own way to fundraise. If you want to know the scientifically proven way to raise more money, we will always give you the best practices and then let you kind of pick and choose from there. Uh, and then even once they do that, so their name, Johnson box, PS, they're still then just skimming the letter. So you need to have short paragraphs, large font, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, let's close out the letter itself portion of this uh, donor segment. So what are we talking with donor segments? Uh, Sarah, we've got a lot that we always use. So any client that we're taking on, um, we're looking at, at a minimum, we're going to do these segments. Uh, any, anything to share on this? What do we mean when we say donor segments? Are we saying we're writing all these different letters? No, that, and that's a great question. So it's easy to write one letter for everybody and send it out. The way that you're going to raise more money is to write a letter that's about 80% the same for everybody. And then by using conditional or variable uh, paragraphs within that letter, you're able to personalize that letter specifically to the donor that's going to be receiving it. So acknowledging if they're one of your recurring steadfast donors or if they're a major donor or they made their gift last year for the first time, your donor is going to feel special if you call out those things to them through conditional formatting and conditional paragraphs. Yep, nailed it. And this is also, this is in order. We get this question a lot. This is the order, like order in which we would prioritize because some people might be a recurring donor and a major donor. Uh, you know, they might be a first time donor and a major donor. This is the level. So the first thing, if you have 10,000 people you're going to mail to, I'm going to scoop up the recurring donors first and they're going to go into that recurring donor segment. Then I'm going to scoop up your major donors and I'm going to scoop up first time donors. And eventually you're left with everybody else. Um, you do not need to write multiple letters. As Sarah said, conditional paragraphs. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, okay. So uh, if you want more information about that, I know we dropped it in the chat. We spent a whole bunch of time talking about the world's greatest fundraising letter. We have templates for you. Feel free to check it out. Um, likewise, the world's greatest pledge card. Let's talk about this for a bit because that's a big part of the direct mail appeal. Um, I'm not going to spend an hour on it. I'm going to spend 30 seconds on it. Here is the best pledge card that has ever existed in the history of the world, uh, according to PSG anyway. Um, after a ton of A-B testing, we have arrived at what is our standard pledge card that we use. Yep. And there's a reason for all of it. I won't go into all the details, but we've A-B tested why it starts with an affirmative statement, why we ask donors to choose and self-select between monthly and annual, um, why the back is the way it is. So we have that template. Go check out if, if you're... Um, Sarah, do you know the number one reason that everybody's pledge card is designed the way that their pledge card is designed? Because the they're answer, old? No. <laughs> <laughs> Every one up, so we got a couple hundred people on the call today. Yeah. If they were to take a look at their pledge card, the reason their pledge card looks the way it is is because that's the way it looked last year, yep. right? That is the only reason that anybody's pledge card looks the way it is, is because at some point that's how it looked. Now is the time. Seize this opportunity. You need to get more recurring donors. You need to make it easier to give. You need to get your donors transitioned from paper to online giving because when you move online, you actually give more. You get email addresses. So take a look at your pledge card. Um, check out the template that we have and, and check out the webinar we did. There's a lot of great research into that. Okay, on the pledge card, uh, something we're very passionate about, how do you set the ask amount? Okay, so we, we spent a great deal of time learning about the best pledge card and we shared the samples there uh, on the previous slide. Now, how do we set the ask amounts? Here's what I mean when I'm talking about ask amounts. Um, if you're mailing a pledge card to a non-major donor, so 95% of your mailing list, you're going to send them a pledge card that has these numbers on it. Not these specifically, but a set of numbers. In our case, we'll always have two strings. Um, but the question we asked was, okay, how do we how do we set those? How do we get the perfect amount for every donor that's not too high and not too low? So when we're sending mail out, Sarah's list starts with uh, $50. Uh, Mr. Mankey's list starts with $65. And that first ask is appropriate to them based on their past giving, based on their giving capacity and everything else. In a research project we did about two years ago, uh, this is Andrew Mankey and myself, we learned there's three ways a nonprofit set ask amounts. Number one is they don't. They just send everybody the exact same pledge card and say, hey, everybody, we're asking all of you to give roughly the same amount. That's absurd. And you're losing so much money. You're leaving a ton of money on the table. The second method is they'll send high, medium, and low pledge cards, which is better, right? You're still leaving a ton of money on the table. 
And the final method is some sort of an algorithm, which is almost always, you know, a variation on look at what the donor gave last year and then add 10%. Okay? That is the world that we're living in and how people are setting ask amounts. The frustrating part for us as consultants who are the biggest data nerds you've ever met is that all of the data that you have sitting inside your, your Salesforce or your, your Bloomerang or Virtuous or Blackbaud Razor's Edge, all that data is sitting in there on your donors and you're not using any of it. And that's maddening to us that you're sending out thousands of direct mail appeals, um, maybe online appeals, and you're asking everybody for the same amount, but you're not taking into consideration what the donor gave last year, you know, what they gave to the special events, how old they are, et cetera, et cetera. So we had this bright idea, uh, Mr. Menke and myself, we told clients, we said, hey, that's crazy. We're going to come in and we're going to do something better. We're going to set custom amounts for every single donor on your list. So we have these clients and these giant mailing lists of 100,000 records. And Andrew and I went through line by line uh, and set ask mounts based on all the data that we had. The way we did it, we went into the razor's edge. We exported things. Over. It looks like that. Uh, if you want to know more uh, about Ask Genius, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here. Uh, but it's it's our side project that's turning into kind of our main product because it's it's been pretty great. Uh, if you want to learn more, actually, here's your chance. I'll launch a poll and you can just mark down and then we'll move on with our direct mail. So if you want to learn more about Ask Genius, uh, we've got hundreds of nonprofits here in the U.S. and now abroad as we work our way through uh, the U.K. and Canada. Uh, let us know. We can follow up. We can give you more information. Crazy useful tool. Let's you set ask amounts. No more, no less. Um, so let us know. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, let us know. If you're already raising too much money, we totally understand. Um, <laughs> lots of folks are already using Ask Genius, I see. All right, so we're closing in three, two, one. We'll end the poll. Thank you. Okay, so that's Ask Genius. That's the pledge card. Now let's get into some tips and tricks and the really technical stuff on direct mail. Okay, so we've talked about how you need to write your letter and the audiences and the segmentation. We've talked about pledge card, how you need to use Ask Strings. Um, and how you need to customize it. Direct mail. First, Sarah, tell me about brand consistency. What do we we talk about this internally all the time? Yeah. What's the point here? What are we What are we talking about? So whether you realize it or not, your annual appeal, your annual fund, whatever that may be, is a brand. It has a brand. So what you'll see kind of here, this is a, just an example, um, but we always promote the idea of, of being sure that what you're sending out matches each other, right? So your envelopes, your letterhead, the swag that may go inside of it, make sure there's a consistent brand to that from a logo to the feel of the content to the copy that it, you're writing inside of it. Um, unfortunately, we see too often organizations that are sending out old letterhead because they have it around inside a newly designed envelope. They don't match. The donors are confused. Um, so something as simple as making sure there's consistency amongst your stock um, is a huge win when it comes to your appeal. Yep. Uh, what do you think, Sarah? We get this question a lot. So a lot of our consulting clients are, are uh, faith-based or large Catholic dioceses that are running $5 million, $10 million, $20 million annual appeals. Look like what's on the screen here. Yeah. Um, we get the question a lot. A lot of them have different themes every year, right? So um, in different logos and different colors and designs and posters. Is that something we should be spending a ton of time on? Is that not important? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think many years ago, uh, a theme was some, a way to help when it comes to design and the content you're writing in the letter itself. But what we've seen over the years, again, whether that's a Catholic organization or a university or um, another nonprofit, what happens is your donors get confused. What, what started out as the annual fund now has become the, you know, the purpose of serving others, right? And so they they get confused about what's, what's the actual thing we're supporting. Um, so we actually recommend um, to the clients that we work with to walk away from, you know, kind of move away from using a theme. Just let your appeal be the theme. Let it be its own standalone um, name and brand, um, because I promise it will help you raise more money because your donors aren't confused about what they're supporting. Yep. And you can change out artwork, of course, like brochures and get yep. new photos. The biggest, if we had any advice for any client we have, it's like spend more money on photos. Like you've been using the same six photos for the last 20 years. It's okay. You can still make things look fresh, yep. but stop spending time trying to think of, is this year's appeal going to be the greatness for excellence appeal, or is it going to be the excellence for greatness appeal? It doesn't matter, right? Make well, it, and you can use that, put it in your letter, right? Uh, use it in uh, the content of what you're sending out. The other thing that happens is when you do that, nine times out of 10, you're going to have waste. You're going to be recycling materials that are unable to be used 
year after year for those more simple pieces. Um, so you're actually wasting money most times um, when you don't need to. That, that sound you hear, the tears and the wails of all the direct mail consultants who spend so much so much of our nonprofit's money coming up with a new color theme and palette and logo designs and all that stuff year after year. Don't need it. Uh, yeah. Use it in the letter. Don't need it on your, your materials. Uh, more on materials. All right, so envelopes. Uh, this has been an exciting time to be in the direct mail fundraising uh, <laughs> world. What do we know, Sarah, about the supply chain stuff? Is it still a mess? What's going on? Uh, paper, no, no one ever thought that obtaining paper and envelopes would be an issue ever. Right. Uh, the last two years have shown, especially the last 18 months, have shown us that we too are part of the huge supply chain issues, right? So it's hard to get number 10s. It's hard to get number nines. It's hard to get things that... Um, that were once easy to get. And so it, keeping in mind when you're planning your appeals um, that you're going to have to build in some extra time and possibly not be as unique with that stock um, as you potentially once were. Yep. And you have to, you can't just count on uh, your printer to have all of the stuff that you need, right? So work as we always Correct. do in direct mail, you got to work ahead. We've got to talk to the printer, yep. um, make sure they have the quantity. Um, and Sarah, your, your face when it freezes on zoom is always better than mine. Like you're kind of half smiling. Usually when my face freezes, um, See, but your face is frozen on mine. So, oh, oh no, <laughs> oh no, it might, it might be me. Mine usually freezes mid sneeze. So, um, Andrew, can you still see the screen? Okay. The bullet two come up. Are we having zoom issues? Uh, I can see Sarah moving. You're frozen, Nick. <laughs> um, I can see the PowerPoint still. We'll give this a shot and see if that helps. Well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so more, uh, what is the goal of the direct mail? We'll let Zoom catch up to us, Sarah. So yeah. what, what's the point of the envelope specifically? We hear all the time about, oh, should we get fancy with it? What yeah. is, what's the main purpose here? At the end of the day, you could put all the hours you want to in designing an incredible direct mail piece. But if the donor doesn't open that envelope, what are you really getting from it, right? So the biggest goal for you with any piece, honestly, is to get that envelope opened. Um, and it doesn't have to be fancy. The reality is, is that, you know, you'll see a lot of envelopes that are have lots of photos and four color and different sizes. Sometimes the best envelopes are those that are two color and very simple and very clean and easy to read. Um, so that is something that, you know, keep in mind with your envelopes as you're preparing for your direct mail pieces, that that should be something that you should plan for. Awesome. Well done. Um, doesn't have to be fancy. Okay. Bang tail. <laughs> Let's talk about bang tail envelopes. I didn't even know what this term was. And now I think I hear it daily. What is a bang tail envelope? How are clients using them? Yeah. So a bang tail envelope is an envelope that's a one and all piece. It's something that's a self mailer a lot of times. So it has the pledge card perforated inside of it. Um, the donor can simply rip off the pledge card and stick it inside the envelope and mail it back to you. It's a very um, simple piece. Um, I'm with that. And they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, and a lot of organizations use them as um, additions to the direct mail letters. So one thing we always recommend is if you want to use a bang tail envelope or, again, that one and all mail piece, um, do so in addition to what you're already sending um, for a direct mail. Don't make it be your one and all, your big mailing of the year, right? Um, a lot of organizations will use these uh, as leave behind pieces, whether that's at an event or um, a commitment weekend, if you're a Catholic organization, um, make sure it's supplementing your direct mail, not taking the place of. Yep, and we see this a lot um, even in hospital foundations, right? So you're in a room, that you're looking for grateful patients. It's a great leave behind, all included, all in one piece. Not recommending it in lieu of a good heartfelt letter, but as a supplement, uh, sort of a universal, a little bit more flexible piece, right? Yep, and yep. Nick, we can't see the slides advancing. Uh, yoink. <laughs> dun 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 Where, what is it that you see on the screen because i might have to pop out and then pop back in yeah that's fine uh just the direct mail materials from the previous slide okay um all right so i will let's see what we can do here um let's see do you mind i'll stop sharing and do you mind uh sharing your screen sure it looks like we're having some uh, zoom issues here on my end yep not a problem so we can go to the window envelopes and you can drive us from there. Okay. Let me... <clears throat> All right. And up next, we're going to talk about your favorite topic, Sarah. <laughs> window get... envelopes. Oh, it is my favorite. It's absolutely my favorite. Okay. Well, she brings it up. I'll tackle in uh, in the questions. A couple of good questions in there. Um, <laughs> note from Michael Gillespie. Thank you, Michael. He says, Ask Genius Works. Thank you. 
Um, Margaret Trahan, uh, if we change your ugly letter, how do we minimize the brand impact? Um, probably worth a little bit more longer conversation. Um, your branding and, and, and uh, your branding, your colors, your style, all that stuff is important. Um, that doesn't mean you can't have a longer letter, right? Um, so feel free to go with a longer letter. Uh, people are not donating because of your theme and your colors. They're donating because your your mission um, that reaches you. Uh, question from Megan. Uh, we have it. So should we have a theme, but don't market it as a theme? Um, a little bit more on what Sarah was proposing. Sarah, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, so absolutely have a theme. Just don't make it part of your design. You can still have a theme and promote it within your letter content. Um, or you can have a printed, you know, a tagline on the outside of the envelope that's done after the stock is printed, but just don't make it something that completely changes your design year after year. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, Andrew, since I'm the one culprit here, can you see a share is Sarah's can you see my screen? Going okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. okay. Sarah, why don't, why don't you run with it here and I'll, I'll chime in. I'm, I'm sure. too nervous to hop out and hop back in. I worry it'll kick <laughs> everybody out. So take it away. Yeah, so windowed envelopes, as Nick said, it is my favorite uh, topic to discuss or not discuss. Um, if the chances are, if your organization is sending out windowed envelopes right now, you are losing donors. It is completely happening um, because you're coming across too much like a solicitor, somebody in the sense of a bill pay or whatever it may be. It's very impersonal and it honestly um, kind of turns your donors away. So something that's, you know, a quick, small change as you're planning for this next year, take away your windowed envelopes. Um, your closed face envelopes are a little bit more expensive to print from a, from a cost perspective, but what you're going to gain in the back end of it is very much worth it. Yep. Nick, we you can see it. you. <laughs> I, actually, I actually just ran to the restroom and it was all a ruse because I had, <laughs> uh, it's good. It's good to be back. So <laughs> So, Sarah, are you saying that if somebody's sending out their fundraising and fields and window envelopes that they need to stop that? Correct. Yes. Sure. If you can financially handle it. I know some organizations, it's not possible. And I understand that completely. Um, but it, it, it is, if you're able to, definitely build this into your budget for the next year. Yep. Uh, this is a hill worth dying on. So there's lots of give and take in any office, right? You're always development and finance are always at loggerheads and development comms. This is a hill worth fighting on because it is costing you money, right? Usually when you're, we see an organization sending window envelopes, it's because the finance office says, oh, these are just fine for bills. Why can't we use them for donors? Don't treat your donors like accounts receivable. You will raise more money and that makes everybody happier. Yep, absolutely. Printing All considerations. Right. All right. So what do, we, what do we got here? What's up? What's up next, Sarah? Yep. So another big thing to keep in mind is, you know, the letters that you're, you're sending, right? So this here is an example of what we like to call a letter response. There's a tear-off pledge card on here, um, and that tear-off pledge card serves, it's perforated at the very bottom, it's a one and all piece, um, and it's very simple to use, um, and a lot of organizations are switching to that. Um, another option also is a standalone pledge card. So some organizations say, well, we want to have a separate pledge card, um, and they do something like this, where there's the what was on the perforated bottom of that, um, or sometimes they use actually a full page pledge card. It just depends on um, what they're printing. Um, either way, it's best to know kind of which audience you're sending to and what you think would work out best for them. Um, and we do have a, a webinar based on this. As Nick has mentioned before, we've done a lot of research on um, pledge card design and what goes into them and what doesn't and what you know, from a design and variable uh, content information uh, perspective. So definitely check that out. Um, to kind of hear more about it as well. And there's um, stats on that too, just for to go yep. for a second. There's stats on um, the full page, uh, who you should use the full page pledge card with. Uh, we have seen research that individual standalone pledge cards that are like tucked inside and not attached do raise more money. We haven't seen it to be a huge amount, but we have seen some of that out there. So Sarah, what, what are the pros and cons for folks that are considering how to do their pledge cards here? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so Tear offs, right? So they're the ones that are attached to the letter of response themselves. They are easier to print. Your printer is able to, at one point, um, decide that they want to, you know, print it off. It, they don't have to match. It's a it's a two two way match between an envelope and a letter itself. They are less expensive as well. Um, the standalone piece is more expensive. You're typically printing that on a separate stock. Um, it also increases your risk of error. So as I mentioned before, if you have an envelope and you have a letter and then you have a standalone 
pledge card, that becomes a three-way match for the printer. So they're having to, whether that's through a 2D barcode or some other coding that they use, they're having to compare to make sure that all three pieces match up, which again, increases your risk of error. Um, Doesn't break, break the spell. Yeah, yeah so that, that's something that we, that we care passionately about. Again, your letter should be heartfelt. It should really mean something to them. Having a pledge card right there can sometimes take away from that, right? So they really yep. get lost in the letter. It's telling a good story. And then there's a pledge card that you kind of got to tear off there. We still don't feel like that's enough of a con to not do it. Right. Uh, but it is something worth mentioning. Yep, absolutely. Some people think that they look a little bit more polished when they're separate. Mm -hmm. Some may feel that way. But again, we've, we've seen that there, there isn't significantly much of a difference in what you're raising by simply printing off that additional card. So why waste the extra money to do it when you can when you can keep it attached? Yep. And we are, so again, I know you're making decisions, the, the viewers here are making decisions for your own nonprofit. We're making decisions for tons of nonprofits representing hundreds of millions of donors and, and tens of millions of dollars. So we need to look at it a little bit differently in the cost benefit standpoint. For us, the risk of a don of a printer screwing up a match is, is greater than any value we would get from a standalone pledge card. So that is the risk that, that we look at the most. I would rather have the printer have everything in one run get it through and make sure we're never going to send a donor a card with the wrong ask amount on it or the wrong address or anything. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, just a few more additional kind of printing considerations. Um, it's 2022. Okay. So any printer that you're working with should be extremely comfortable with variable data. They should also know what variable data is. There are printers out there um, that if their first question is what is variable data, run. <laughs> yeah, that's red flag number one. We'll, we'll share red flag number two. And we've, yep. we found that, right? So a, any printer that says, oh, you know, Nick and Sarah, we don't really like to, you know, drop in those different paragraphs. And, yep. you know, we, we just like to, you know, why don't we just do a dear friend letter, right? That is a sign that you are not really working with a printer, right? You are working with a copy machine. Um, so it's 2022. Everything on the screen there uh, that's circled in green is a variable data field. Uh, so I guess, is there a comment on, I guess, on that and how the, yeah. the spreadsheet that we're giving to printers? Yeah. So anything in green uh, circled here has a matching column in the data file that I send to the printer or that you would send to the printer so that the printer can very easily put in merge fields as they're preparing the letters and pull from it. So that's why, you know, your data is clean. You can ensure consistency amongst, you know, the letters that they're receiving everything has a match and that's what makes it a very uh, you know kind of awesome process is that there's no error on the back end of it as long as your data is clean and everything has a column yep well said yeah okay in the same kind of vein as that always be sure your mailing list is sent as a single excel file um the more sophisticated printers actually prefer it they're going to say to you sarah send me one file that has all that clean data every column i'm going to need and i'll go through the printer will go through and match up as b it gets really hairy when you start working with a printer that says well i need different tabs for different segments or i need different data files for different versions um yeah. nick because what happens with that yeah. when you start having the different yeah versions? <laughs> i'll tell you what happens does that <laughs> So that's, and, and I, we don't even bag on printers. There's wonderful mom and shop printers out there. Yep. But again, we're working at large volumes, so we can't have any mistakes. When a printer says, hey, Nick, we're going to have seven different versions. Can you give me the data in seven different tabs? Giant red flag, right? Because that tells you that the, the, the printer is kind of taking that segmentation and asking you to do it for them. It also means with there's nothing more certain. There's It's death, taxes, and then the fact that as soon as you split up a mailing list, you will have to change that mailing list, right? You will split it into tabs and then you'll realize that you forgot to include last name or salutation or something changes. And then you don't just have one spot to change. You have seven different spots that you have to change. Guaranteed you will do it wrong. Guaranteed things are going to get screwed up. So we do have some clients we, we do this for, of course, because that's how the printer wants it, but it makes us nervous every single time. You want to give, you want to find a printer if you're using a mailhouse that can get your spreadsheet with a column for every different piece of variable data in one sheet, in one spot that you can always check out. Yep, okay. absolutely. We feel passionately about this, Sarah. <laughs> we do, because learn from our errors, right? It's, it's inevitable. When you do direct mail, there's going to be an issue at some point, right? Yeah, minimize so, risk everywhere you can. This is absolutely. something that you can control. Absolutely. Um, just a few more to kind of technical things to keep in mind um, as you're working through your direct mail projects. NCOA. So if you don't know yet what NCOA is, uh, it stands for National Change of Address. 
So your printers should be before hitting mail, right? And putting hitting print and sending it in the mailboxes, they should be running that data file mm -hmm. through the US Postal Service's National Change of Address Registry. Um, what that does is it'll shoot back a report to the printer that says, hey, these are old addresses now sent to this address because that donor has moved or had a, you know, a change of address temporarily. Um, it also will tell you if there's somebody that they live more in a rural area um, and you should mail them first class to ensure the likelihood of that direct mail piece actually arriving in their mailbox. Um, so all of this information comes from an NCOA report that is useful not only at the time of mailing, but also on the back end. Be sure your printers are sending you a data file after the fact that's your NCOA report as well as your final mail file. That allows you to update your database to ensure that any moving or future mailings moving forward are utilizing that updated address and not sending to old. Yes, and that's something that, that's a huge thing uh, we see happen quite a bit, right? The yep. clients, they, they, they trust the mailhouse to, to run it through NCOA, but yep. they don't take that extra step, right, to bring in those, they call them Nixies and other things that have there, get your data clean. Uh, it's just a good practice to, and we understand life's crazy and you got a million yep. things going on. It really is important to bring in that those changes, otherwise you're just continuing to to pay for it every single mailing. Well, and sometimes printers aren't automatically sending that either. So right, if point. you you need to kind of make note to yourself to reach back out to them and say, hey, I want this. Um, if they look at you like you're crazy, <laughs> keep asking because they it's part of what they have to do as a printer. It's part red of their- flag number, Red flag number three is if your yeah. printer, we should have retitled this whole webinar. Um, <laughs> red flags. <laughs> yeah, if your printer doesn't want to send you the NCOA results. Exactly. Um, the other big thing lately, if you haven't heard, Postage went up again for the second or third time in 2022. Um, so this is something too that will be in the slides that you're able to see, but just know that your postage in general is going up. So when you're looking at mailings, that postage cost is gonna continue to increase if you're doing things as is, um, which is why it's even more important to really personalize um, who you're sending to and, and, and looking at those different groups that we sent to and recommend to in the past, making sure you get that best ROI on the mailings that you are sending out. Um, so kind of keep an eye out for that. The other thing to keep in mind, if you're not doing it already, um, how you're sending and what your postage um, is also very important. You don't need to mail everybody using a first class stamp. Let's start there. Um, if you don't already have um, a kind of a postage paid or a nonprofit status with the post office, definitely look into that. Um, it will save you significant costs when it comes to mailing. The other thing to keep in mind of is that a lot of designers, printers will encourage you to use this, uh, what's called an indicia. It's a nonprofit indicia. It's very easy to slap on an envelope in design um, and print. Um, it's easier for the printer, though, and not necessarily donor centric. So if a printer says to you, oh, let's use the indicia, I recommend you push back a little bit, say, and ask them to, in place of it, utilize a nonprofit postage stamp. They exist. It costs possibly maybe one cent more to affix it to the envelope than the indicia does itself. But when the donor receives it, it looks like a first class stamp, but just with a different design um, and allows you to save costs on the back end. And this this will blow people's minds as well. So I didn't know this until, you know, uh, I think a year ago, Sarah was telling me about it. So I thought stamps were all first class. It's not the case. You can still get your nonprofit rates with a nonprofit stamp, don't get talked into or bullied into using the, the little uh, generic uh, indicia, yep. use a stamp because it will raise you more money. There's a reason behind all of this. We'd love to save you one cent per direct mail that you send out, but we're not gonna do that because you're, it, that cost is gonna be offset by increased number of people who open your mail and who send in gifts. Absolutely. Um, another service that's out there you may not know of is uh, Track and Trace. So with COVID, we found that um, mailings weren't being delivered as quickly as we were used to, especially for the more kind of first class mails, mailings that went out. So track and trace is something that you're able to attach to a mailing for a nominal fee. Um, anywhere, typically it's less than $50, to be honest. Um, you apply that as a per thousand fee to it. And what happens is every letter receives a barcode and you're able to track every piece of mail in your mailings and see when it was delivered to the post office and see when it was delivered to the home that it was being mailed to. Um, on the back end, about two weeks after it goes out, you'll get up to five or six reports from the post office saying, hey, by zip code, this is how many letters were received in this zip code and how many days it took by state, by you know area, region. Um, I definitely recommend doing this at least once a year, typically with your larger mailings um, to make it worth kind of the cost that you're, do that you're using and spending for it. Um, 
but look into it if you haven't yet used it because it is a, a, an awesome program to utilize. Yep. And, and while we go on to the next question, I'll say there's so many great questions that are popping up. So if you have questions, hit that Q&A button. There's already about eight or nine in there that we're going to get to. Awesome. This topic is clearly near and dear at everybody's heart, Sarah. So we're getting great questions here. I uh, just want to remind people, put them in the Q&A. Don't put them in the chat because we probably already lost them. If you put a question in the chat, move it over to the Q&A so we can tackle it in about two minutes here. Yep. Uh, I like talking about windowed envelopes. Nick likes talking about informed delivery. <laughs> I, I do. This was one of those moments in life. Uh, where you're like, wait, this thing really exists. So there's a free service from the postal service that you can sign up for. Just Google informed delivery, uh, where they will email you every morning the mail that you're going to get that day. I can't tell you how much I enjoy uh, getting this in the morning. So I have an office, I'm not at home and I run a small business. So finding out, hey, did that check finally come through or did that thing we're waiting on? Uh, more, more often it's Hey, that, you know, new, you know, baseball glove that my son ordered, you know, is, is that package arriving today, but they will tell you every morning. So you can sign up to get this. Now, what's interesting about it. So you can sign up for free. You get an email from the post office with a scan of all the mail that you're getting. You can, um, as a, as a organization, you can pay the post office more like you see on this LifeLock one here. And I kind of chopped it up between the, the two pages. Yeah. You can tell that Norton LifeLock is sending me a direct mail piece but I can actually click on that to learn more. So that's an organization paying more to make it sort of multi-channel. So you're yep. sending out your direct mail. Now, Sarah, have we seen any nonprofit of our clients do this yet? No, not yet. Cause sometimes a lot of times those are gonna be the more business trying to sell you things. What I like to use this for is I actually, if you don't already seed yourself or put your physical address inside each of your data files as mailings are being sent out, I'm able to see when mailings are coming to my house through this. And so it allows me to, you know, know immediately, like, okay, this mailing arrived on time or there was a delay in the post office. So that's how I like to use this too. Yep. And I'm seeing in the chat, lots of people also uh, do this. So if you're as delighted by small things as I am, uh, go do this today. Uh, it's great. Uh, I, I really enjoy it. Um, okay. So let's do a lightning round on this. So, and, and actually I have a poll that I'm gonna put up after this slide, Sarah, just to ask if people wanna know more. We at, at, at PSG spend a ton of time working with lockbox providers, gift processors, you know, caging organizations. Like we've learned more about this than, than, I, than I ever wanted to know about scan lines and mod 10 and optical scanning and stuff. What's the 30 second version for folks on the line here today? Yeah. So if you've ever seen those weird long numbers on the bottom of a pledge card, um, that's called an OCR scan line. And that is a scan, a number that lock boxes, which are typically held, hosted at a bank or a printer, as Nick said, um, they're able to automatically process gifts for you um, that come in through pledge cards. Typically, these services are used by organizations that have a very small or non-existent gift processing department um, to help expedite how long it takes to process gifts um, on their end. Um, from a pro perspective, again, you're cutting down on the cost of time that it takes your employees to process gifts. You're acknowledging your donors quicker and faster. Um, you're also able to, on the back end, after gifts are processed, to import that information automatically into your system um, versus having to go line by line and donor by donor, putting that information in. Um, some cons, there's a cost associated with it. So again, if you're if you have staff or you have the budget to do it, um, kind of weighing out, is it better to invest that in a person or potentially, you know, an organization or a company that can help you out with that? Um, and it takes some time to get set up. Um, so, you know, big recommendation, if you're looking at ways to process gifts quicker, reaching out to and just planning and giving yourselves at least six months to a year to really plan out that process. Yep. And we just got a call from a, from a client in Colorado yesterday who's looking to make the switch. Their big mailing goes out in February and they're looking right now. Again, just, just assume that everything will take twice as long. Um, yeah. But once it's up and running, it'd be great. If you're a large foundation um, and you have people retiring, or you just want to get out of the game of hiring temps to come in and process gifts, uh, there's some great options out there. There's drawbacks. Uh, um, actually, let me put the poll up. Um, yeah. We're going to find out whether people want to learn more about this or not. Um, okay, so on your screen, what webinar should we do next? We already have about 20 more topics we're going to do. But I'm curious um, from folks, please weigh in. Um, do you want, in, there's a couple of things that might be too nerdy or they might be right up your alley, right? So we're, we're considering an in-depth discussion about Sarah, like package codes, appeal codes, yep. you know, scan lines like tracking and segmenting. So if you wanna know more about that, please, you can click on multiple ones here. Um, or if you uh, let us know, if you want more, we can really nerd out and spend an hour talking about 
lock boxes and caging and things like that. Um, email one is on tap for next week. It looks like we did not next week. I think it's in two weeks. It looks like we did pretty well there. So please let us know if there's <laughs> also uh, feel free to let us know through other topic that you want to know more about holler and we would we love nothing more than putting together you know 45 minute presentations with with everything that we know on that topic okay so after this here's uh check your check your email here's what we're going to send you and then we're going to get to q a uh, a link to the webinar recording um plus we're going to send you more information on um of course you can download the slides more information about ask genius for those that want it uh links to prior webinars this one touched on like two main ones um, no, you're fine. Uh, the letter <laughs> one and then the pledge card one. So we'll send you links just to make sure you can get to those. I know there's a lot of interest in that. Yep. Um, also for the folks, as I've been getting notes throughout this, if you do want to know more about Ask Genius, we try not to be too sales heavy, right? Our, our whole goal is to, to provide great information, but also we know many of you use it and many of you want to use it. Every time we do a webinar like this, we open up 10 private demo spots. So Andrew, who's on the call here with us, uh, if you want to scan that QR code on the left, It'll take you to his calendar and you can figure out a time that works best. That's if you want to have us sit down and talk with you, with your university, your diocese, your high school. We'll talk about Ask Genius. Or if you don't want to schedule a private demo, on the right-hand side, um, in two, uh, next Friday, August 5th. Sarah, can you believe it's August already? Oh no. My <laughs> I don't know what happened in July. <laughs> Holy cow. So next Friday is August, uh, August 5th. We're going to do a live demo. So this is, we usually get 30 or 40 different organizations that come. They sit in. Andrew and I do a very informal walk through the product, show how it works, show case studies, show how much more money it'll raise. So that's everything about Ask Genius. Uh, please reach out if you have questions, but we'd love to see you either in a private demo uh, or do a, a live product demo next Friday, you can join. Uh, no cost, no strings attached, no obligations. We are as informal as it gets. Okay, so Q&A, let me jump in here. Actually, I'll go to Andrew first. Andrew, is there anything as I go and scroll through this, anything <clears throat> that you saw on there that you think we definitely need to tackle? first year while we got folks on the line? Uh, well, it seems a lot of the questions have to do with uh, with envelopes. So I think <laughs> jumping into that a little bit more, yeah, a little more detail. All right, so, let, so let's do that. Um, all right, question from Barb, Sarah for you. So suggestion for an outer an envelope. Should we have a teaser? You know, should we have a little handwritten note there? Mm -hmm. um, anything else that could be placed? Like what have we seen that works well? Thoughts on the outer envelope? Yeah, I definitely recommend, you know, that upper left hand area, leave that for your logo, leave that for your your organization's address, right, or on the back, what, leave that space open. But I definitely think there's a place for a tagline um, on the bottom left hand, kind of for that open space. Just keep in mind that there is um, about a two inch area in the middle that you cannot touch from a post office perspective. Um, but as long as you stay in that lower left-hand quadrant, you should be fine. Um, a lot of times, you know, thank you so much for your support or, you know, a special message from Dean so-and-so, right? You can do things like that to tease or entice donors to open. Um, just keep in mind that you don't want to clutter your envelope at the same time. Yep. And what I would recommend, if you're large enough, if you're, if you're a university um, uh, or a diocese, A-B test this, right? Get in the habit of testing things. If you're sending out more than 2,000 pieces of direct mail, Send a thousand of them an envelope with a tagline, send a thousand of them an envelope without a tagline, and then find out um, from the responses what your donors yep. like the best. And it's, it, you can easily add a tagline to a number 10 envelope as well. I think that's one question that we've seen is, it's, is it too small? And it's not. Yep. It's just a matter of where you place it. Yep. And, and, and don't feel like you have to. So this is, we don't have enough data to tell you absolutely. Yep. <laughs> we are pretty certain on things like window envelope, pledge card design. Tagline on the outside, I don't have enough quantitative data to tell you it absolutely will raise you more money. Um, so use your judgment. Please tell us, you know, what you see, but don't be afraid also to not have one, right? Like, so sometimes it can be really cheesy. Like you see that, Sarah, like we get direct mail and it's got stuff all over the outside, you know, a very special exclusive offer. Like, yeah, you know, if your logo resonates with me, like it's from Creighton University, I recognize that I'm going to open it and see what it's all about, as long as it's not in a window envelope. Um Tammy asked a question. Can we use window envelopes for acknowledgement letters? I wouldn't recommend it because, again, that donor is going to think it's a bill. You spend you're thanking your donors who just invested in your organization and your mission. Um, spend the extra cents to, to use a closed faced envelope. Yep. Well done. And a stamp. <laughs> That's right. Even if it's a nonprofit stamp, doesn't mean it has to be a first class. Hundred percent. Yep. yep. Um, question from Greg. What's the best way to use best way to use a bank till envelope uh, for diocesan appeal, uh, Sarah? 
Yeah, I would say the bang tail, we've seen the best success with your NPO. So anytime that it is, you know, parishioners coming to, um, you know, mass for the day or whatever it may be, um, use it as a leave behind. Quick, they can grab it, they can put their gift in um, and, and be on their way. So yep. definitely don't use it as it's a standalone piece, though, in place of a direct mail letter. Yep, yep. Um, and, and by that same token, uh, I think we talked a lot in the fundraising letter webinar, postcards, right? Do not replace letters, heartfelt letters with postcards. We see a lot of design agencies recommending, oh, you can reach new donors. And you know how those, you know how those millennials love them some postcards. Like people don't donate off postcards. There's a there's a purpose for them. Uh, fundraising is not one of those purposes. Okay. So don't replace a heartfelt letter. And why, Sarah? Because what do we know about our donors? Well, the older generation, they like postcards, but again, okay. if you're not getting your bang for your buck with what you're spending in that. <laughs> they donate from heartfelt uh, letters That's often correct. longer than what you think. A uh, question from uh, someone here, uh, tear off, should we use pre-populated addressee? Yes, that is the whole point of having a tear off pledge card, right? Is yep. so that your printer can run it through. You can personalize the heck out of it. You can have the donor's name. I think when we talk about the pledge card on that webinar, we go into a lot of stuff about uh, donor recognition, right? So there's really cool advanced level stuff you can do when you have the pledge card attached to the letter. You can put a little recognition, say, you know, 2020, 21, 22, put checkbox next to checkbox next to each of those years saying you've been donating, you know, the last four years. You can recognize a donor for how long they've been giving. You can have a little badge on there that says 10 year giver. All that stuff is what you can do. We can personalize it. And if you don't, and if you run the pledge card separately, you run a huge risk of the printer screwing that up, right? And, and not yeah. matching them up correctly. I'm sure there's competent printers out there that can do it. We just want to avoid that risk. So that's why we use the tear offs uh, as often as we do. Um, okay, uh, question from Michael. Do you typically work with clients like dioceses that mail one big annual appeal per year? You know, what are your thoughts on mailing more frequently, multiple times per year? Uh, Sarah, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, I would say no matter if you are a diocese or a university or a hospital foundation, um, it is nice to have one big mailing whenever that works best for you. For some organizations, that's in January uh, when the calendar year starts off. For others, it's when the fiscal year starts off, right? But be the most inclusive with that large mailing and then trickle back from there as you get further into your uh, appeal year. Yep. And even when you have that anchor, so most universities have their annual fund, like there's also, you know, usually the, the routine is quarterly, right? The yep. annual fund is the big one I get every year. And then quarterly, it's like, oh, would you support this department or this initiative? So yes, a, a regular cadence is important. Most clients, whether you're a diocese, university, high school, have an anchor appeal. And when we talk about appeals, that's typically what we mean. And then there's, a, you know, the segmented ones that, that follow quarterly. So absolutely on that. Abby has a question that leads into one of our future webinars. Uh, she asked, how do you coordinate segments with major gift officers? You know, we often have gift officers that want to segment their letters. All right, so two things, Abby. Uh, number one, yes, that's great uh, if it's manageable. So if you have 10,000 people you're mailing to and uh, you want to, you have major gift officers who each have maybe 100 people, find out how many they can realistically customize, give them those letters to customize, let them send it out, that's great. But what you're really talking about that would scratch the itch is automation. And we're going to do a whole webinar, probably a webinar series on um, some email automation that will scratch this itch, that will let your major gift officers follow up to your direct mail with a more personalized uh, message to those folks. Um, I don't want to get into it more than that because I know we're running out of time. Uh, but Abby, great question. We've got a lot of stuff coming on the automation uh, side in the future. Um, we can probably... Stop there. Most of these are still you know, envelopes and themes and stuff like that that we've, we've tackled here. Um, okay, so those of you that stuck around, I apologize. We kept you two minutes longer. I'm going to blame that on my internet connection here. Thank you, Sarah, for jumping in and saving the day as she does on, on all things. Um, so folks, uh, make sure to uh, look for your email. We will send you a link to the next webinar we're doing. Uh, please check out Ask Genius if you haven't yet. Uh, it's going to save you a ton of time. It's going to raise you a lot more money, which is a, a pretty great uh, recipe in our book. Uh, we appreciate all of you being here today, and uh, we'll catch you on the next webinar. All right. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Andrew. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.